Gracious Lord, we've come before you and we ask for that help to hear you. Paul, from a Roman prison, tells the church of Corinth and us, it's not about me, Lord. And he tries to give us the encouragement to have the confidence to be second fiddle. So, Lord, as we listen to some possible gifts, as there are many more that aren't even mentioned, help us understand that these gifts are to no value unless we are able to appreciate your kingdom and the rewards, and the rewards is eternal life, and helping others find that reward, that joy of forgiveness unconditionally. Help us put aside our need to be recognized. And help us understand what it means to be part of the team of God's kingdom. Holy Spirit, open our hearts, our ears, our mind, our souls. So that we might have those distractions removed and we hear you. Gracious Lord, with with humbleness and gratitude, but yet expectation. May the words that I say be your words, not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so here we continue on a sermon series on the Holy Spirit, and I've tried to introduce it. Now I'm going to try to give some ideas of gifts. And the gifts that I list are not all the gifts. So the biggest thing I want to do today is two main things. First of all, and I'll touch back on this because it's really the most important part of the message, are we willing to use our gifts... For God's kingdom, not for self-centeredness. In other words, how confident are we? Or where is the lack of confidence as we use these gifts? Do we need them to build up our self-esteem? Or can we put that on the shelf and be about God's kingdom? And then the secondly, I may introduce a gift that you have. I mean that. I really do. In fact, I've seen some of these gifts already shine in some of you in the few short weeks that I've already been here. But these are not all the gifts. Gifts are expansive as God. There's not just like eight gifts, and if you don't fit that category, you're not gifted. It's just to get us thinking, what is my gift? And there are multiple gifts in each of us. I saw gifts this week in the Boundary Waters. I mean that. I remember going across a portage, and I think we portaged. Portage, by the way, is where you carry all your equipment from one lake on land to another. So we had to carry four canoes. Tell me if I'm wrong. And we had to carry, I believe, eight packs or seven packs. And we had to get all that equipment across. And we had portages that were 100, 150 rods. Rod is the length of a canoe. So if you can picture 150 canoes lined up, we did those portages. I carried a canoe and I prayed to the dear Lord that if I took enough time, I could get across that portage and everything else would be there. (laughs) So we had a team. And I mean that. We had workhorses. You have no idea how nice it is after you get that canoe dropped and you head back to get some other equipment and at least all the canoes are across. you just got a pack maybe waiting for you. These are gifts that a team brings, not individuals. And I got to tell you, this is a lifelong learning lesson. I can point out, unfortunately, times where I knew I have the gift and I use the gift and I realize as I look back, God, I use that gift only to lift me up. And God is interested in lifting God's kingdom up. Maybe the best way to phrase it is, I just want to get to heaven, but I want to take as many people with as possible. So as we think about our gifts, are we using them? And this takes a a lifelong learning discipline of confidence over the issue of needing to be recognized. Are we using them to spread God's kingdom? Maybe a way to illustrate this is a famous actor was once asked by a a TV reporter, what is the single trait that, that separates actors from anybody else? And this actor, without missing a beat, replied, that's very simple. You could always tell a famous Hollywood actor when you talk to them, and all of a sudden the conversation switches from them being the center of attention, they get a dazed look in their eyes. Why? Or maybe you remember a football player for the Minnesota Vikings, the New England Patriots, and some other teams that was, one, I think, honestly, one of the most gifted wide receivers in the NFL, 
but couldn't get his act together because he needed to always be the center of attention. I think we all know who we're talking about. Randy Moss. I hate to pick on him, but folks, I feel for that guy. Physically, he is gifted. I saw him make catches in the late 90s for the Vikings that I don't think anybody else could ever make. And the joy was we even beat the Packers. That's the best part of it. <laughs> but we all remember Randy Moss. We couldn't even get a restaurant for him to please him. His head was bigger than his gift. And because of that, sadly, I merely mean this, he had to retire early because he couldn't get it together upstairs. He had the gift to be the best wide receiver in the NFL, but he couldn't, he couldn't get it together upstairs. And so Paul puts it a lot more delicately as he introduced the gifts, and Deb spent a lot of time kind of introducing that from Paul's words from a Roman prison he writes in the church of Corinth. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit in verses 4 through 6. There are a variety of services, their gifts also, but the same Lord. There are a variety of activities, but the same God who activates all of them and everyone. I remember when I was planning a mission trip for a youth group to Florida, to South Dade County. Some of you are too young to ever remember this, but you read about it in your history books. But Back in 1994, a hurricane came across Miami and southern Florida called Hurricane Andrew. It was a Category 4, just wiped out that part of the state. And I took youth groups there up through about 99 to do recovery work for Hurricane Andrew through Habitat uh, for Humanity. And I was putting a youth mission trip together between Christmas and New Year's down to South Dade County. And one of the parents called me because her son was a very good golf player. I mean, a really good golf player. And she wanted to make sure, and I'm not making this up, this is going to, things never cease to surprise me anymore, but she wanted to make sure that her son would be able to take an afternoon off, I'm not making this up, to play golf while he was on this mission trip, because Florida has such excellent golf courses. <laughs> I am not making that up. The son went. I felt more for that mother than I did the son, because she just didn't get it. That's wasting gifts. And so as we move through this message, folks, just take an inventory. And I know it's harsh because I have to do this to myself every day. These are not fun inventories sometimes because all of a sudden we realize, you know, I had that gift so I could look good. And that's not exactly what Paul's saying here about that. So as we look for our gifts, as we recognize our gifts, let's look at what it means to use those gifts for God's kingdom instead of being noticed. I love the guy that helped me out during ski camp. He said, just make sure I play second fiddle. I thought, that's the gift I want. And then he goes on and he begins to introduce these gifts. And I'm just going to list them up. If we're sincere, we begin to recognize the gifts we have. He begins in verse 8, and he talks about different types of gifts of wisdom and knowledge. In verse 8, he says, and, and these aren't all the gifts. There are so many gifts, and I really mean that with Nathaniel here. I do not have the gift to fish. If you, believe, if you don't believe me, you just ask Dan, okay? I don't have the gift to fish. I don't have the patience, the desire. I don't want the gift to fish, okay? <laughs> But I am so grateful that there were about six people in the Boundary Waters with me that had the gift to fish, and I mean that, because if they didn't have the gift to fish, we had to eat freeze-dried food. I don't know if you've ever had freeze-dried beans, but you might as well drink water instead. Because they had the gift to fish, we had enough fish every night. If we would have been dependent on me, it would have been very troublesome. So I'm grateful for all these gifts. Some of us have the gift of mechanics. We can fix things just by diagnosing it. Some of us, my dad, and I know some of you here, you have the gift of building. And you can just, you can, you can envision, I mean this, these are gifts. You can envision a house and you can say, okay, this is our foundation, this is what you need to do. Boom. There it is. If you don't think that's a gift, you're missing the point. Some of you have the gift of patience. The gift of teaching. 
Some of you have the gift of cleanliness, cleaning. There are so many gifts, but, but Paul opens up in verse 8. To one is given through the Spirit the gift of the utterance of wisdom, another the utterance of knowledge. Now let me explain. One of these gifts, he means, is, is the fact that you just have pure wisdom. That means you can understand something. You, you can help people say, this is what's being said. I actually have that kind of gift with scripture. People come to me and say, what is being said in this scripture? I say, well, here's what's being said. And then some of us have the gift, not just of wisdom, but utterance of knowledge, how to apply the gift. Once we understand it, we apply it. We don't just put it on the shelf, oh, I'm glad I know that, and then waste it. Some of us say, how are you going to apply that in your daily life? Now that you get it, what are you going to do about that? Well, how can I apply it? Well, you can apply it this way or that way. We call that mentoring. And you have that gift. And the challenge is, are you using those gifts of understanding and mentoring? I have certain pastors that are now retired. I meet with them on a regular basis because I need them to help me. And it's called mentoring. Then Paul goes on and he says the gift in verse 9 of, of faith and healing. To another, faith. Again, by the same Spirit. It's how he always gets that in there. And to another, the gift of healing. Again, by the one Spirit. Some of us, and, and you are, I've already recognized some of you in this congregation, you have that long-tested gift of time. You are the oak tree of faith. I have friends that when I'm going through troubling times, I can call them to not just pray for me, I can lean on them. Because their faith is so stable. When mine gets weak, they hold me up. Those of you that are that oak tree of faith, don't you leave this congregation because I will hunt you down. <laughs> I'm going to need you. I really mean that. There's going to be times where we go through trials and tribulations. I'm going to need your oak tree to lean on so I have the energy to be your pastor. I need those people that have that faith. I consider the gentleman standing in the rubble of a tornado and the house is just flattened. And he picks up a picture of him and his wife and his wife standing together unharmed. And everybody's saying, you're a poor house. And he's just standing there smiling and saying, this is nothing. We still have our lives. This can all be replaced. That's the gift of faith. And then there's the gift of healing. Now, I want to point this out. Often we misinterpret that gift, and we say we think of healing from the TV evangelist. You put your hand, and boom, they can walk. I believe that God can heal miraculously. Don't ever underestimate our God. And I've witnessed that at times. Some of you may know, or we may have people in our congregation that have put 10 years of study and discipline into college and graduate school and med school and then on into residency, and now are gifted healers. We have a lot of technology in our country. When I, you'll find me that when I pray, Nicholas had surgery this week, and it went good, but he's in recovery. But he had an extensive surgery at Children's Hospital in Abbott on Thursday, and he's doing good. But you know what? There was a team of doctors that put together years of discipline and practice, and they have the gift of healing, and their skills shine. You'll hear me when I pray for people that are going into surgery. I'll say, Lord, please let the doctor's skills shine. It's a gift of healing. Some of you have the gift of healing because you can listen. You can, and, and when I mean listen, you're hearing what they're saying. And you have that empathy for them. I don't know about you, but I'm a little extroverted. A little surprised. When I get a good listener with me that really wants to hear me and let me vent, I am so grateful. That is the gift of healing. And then Paul goes on, and he kind of begins to wrap it up. And he says there's gifts, other gifts, the gifts of prayer, the gifts of preaching, the gifts of discernment, and the gifts of tongues. And he moves on in that verse, and he explains all those gifts. 
I just want to lift up the gift of prayer. Somebody said to me today, you're out. Our prayers were answered. You know who you are. Thank you. The Boundary Waters, like ski camp, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in the Boundary Waters. And when things go wrong in the Boundary Waters, they kind of tumble down. There's not room for error. You're on your own up there. And I've had some, some, needed, or some, some disasters up there. And we've watched the news and we've heard of that. Because of your prayers, don't take that lightly. We got out just fine. Those prayers are needed. And those are gifts. I hope that if you have the gift of praying, I sincerely mean this, I want you to pray for me. I need you to pray for me. I hope you pray for this church. I hope you pray for our youth. I hope you pray for our staff. This is a gift. Then there's that gift of preaching, and, and here's the point, folks. I understand, and I'm grateful. I mean that. I have been given the gift to preach, and I am grateful for that. But all of you out there, don't say, well, that's just a gift for the preacher. That, no. Some of you are in sales. You probably have the gift of preaching. I'm not making that up. Some of you can, can talk to people. My wife says that I can talk to a dead tree and wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> If you're extroverted, you love the Lord, you probably have the gift of preaching. Gift of preaching is not just for preachers. And I'm just encouraging you, if you're into sales, if you're extroverted, you can do that. You like to study, think about it. I won't put you up here and, and let you be all up here by yourself. and won't help you, but I'm willing to help you explore that gift. I think there's a lot of us that have the gift of preaching. And the gift of discernment, the gift of understanding... What is being said? What needs to be interpreted? What needs to be done? The gift of understanding and discernment. We need those people that can diagnose what someone is saying. Say, this is what I think is being done. This is where you need to go. What you need to do. The gift of discernment and answering the problem. And then Paul ends up with that gift of tongues. I'm going to spend a little time on this. That gift of tongues, that's, um, that's an interesting thing. It, it has put the church into embarrassing places over the last years. In Paul's time, tongues was a gift, and it was being used a lot. But right now, we have certain churches, I'm sorry to say, even denominations that literally teach that if you don't have the gift of tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. I'm here to tell you that's blasphemy. It's bad, it's wrong, it's sinful. You don't need to jump on a person when they say that to you, but it is not scriptural. And don't let people tell you that. Is the gift of speaking in tongues, is that a gift? Yes, it is. It's one of many millions of gifts. And it's a good gift. We get kind of scared when it happens because it's done inappropriately. I can remember one time in college, uh, my roommate and I went to this church that was more Pentecostal than not, and we wanted to see it on a Sunday night service, and we were there, and there was a lot of speaking in tongues, and there was an altar call, and we didn't know what was going on, but we felt like it was holy. So don't Get scared about the gift of tongues. Just don't let people tell you it's the only way to the Holy Spirit. I want to share a little bit of understanding. I've actually had the gift of tongues from time to time. I've done it in appropriate ways, and some of you may have too. That's wonderful. Just make sure it's done appropriately. But I want to share with you a story of my granddad, my mother's father. Now, he's in heaven now. <clears throat> But when he was a young man in his 20s, he did some very terrible things. And eventually, he felt and found real forgiveness. I mean that. And when he found that forgiveness, he had such compassion for God because he thought, how can God forgive what I've done? And he, he actually had so compassion that he devoted his life. He was a, a, a sheet metal worker in a manufacturing plant in South Minneapolis his whole life, but, but he devoted his life to introducing Christ to people. He was very, very passionate about God's grace and forgiveness. And every year, he went to family camp in Motley, Minnesota for the Free Methodist Camp. 
And one year he told me this story when I was in seminary before he passed on to be in heaven. But one year he went to family camp over in Motley, Minnesota at the Free Methodist Camp. I, I don't even think it's there anymore. It's been sold. But he was there and they had an evening service in the late 40s, post-World War II days. And he went up to the altar that night as a new born-again Christian. And he began to pray and he began to what he thought was speaking in tongues. He didn't know it, but he, he just felt it. And he just started praising God and weeping and speaking in tongues. And after the service was over, he was heading out of it. They just had tent uh, buildings then. He was, he was heading out of the, the tabernacle, the tent tabernacle. And a lady stopped him, kind of tearful, and said, I didn't know that you spoke in the Swedish tongue. And my grandfather said, I don't know anything about the Swedish tongue, ma'am. And she got kind of emotional. And she said, oh, she goes... He goes, I'm only Dutch. It's the only language I know in English. And she said, well, my husband was in a pew behind you when you were praying. And he could hear your words and you were speaking scripture verses in the Swedish tongue. And because of that, he went forward and knelt at the altar. And my granddad began to realize what just happened. I'm not making any of that up. That's not to blow us out of the water. I just don't want us to be fearful of the gift of tongues. I do think the church has abused that gift and smeared it all over the mud of bad naming for the church. But I don't want us to, to be scared of it. That's for sure. Finally, as we wrap it up, folks, there are many gifts. I just said a few of them. Some of you have the gift of just affirmation. Some of you have the gift of building each other up. Some of you have the gift of motherhood. Some of you have the gift of fatherhood. Some of you have the gift uh, of skills that are beyond understanding. Some of you have the gift of computer skills, if you do see me after church, by the way. <laughs> We're still working on that. Some of you have the gift of patience. Some of you have the gift to do things that nobody else would do. I've seen some of you go up and down the road and just pick up litter, not because you have to, but because you want to. Those are gifts. And my challenge to all of you this week, I don't care who you are, we are all gifted. We are not dogs or cats. We are humans created in the image of God. Every now and then I have a little talk with my dog buddy and I remind him, he's a dog. He's always going to be a dog. I have a stick of beef jerky that I got mm, from Boss Farms, uh, free advertisement, and it is really good. And he sits there and he looks at me and he wants the beef jerky. And I tell him this is what separates him from the human world. <laughs> he's not going to get the beef jerky. He's got dog food. I pay for it. It's his. You see, he's a dog. He's limited. You and I, we are created in God's image. And because of that, we have gifts and we have a responsibility to use those gifts for God's kingdom. And so my challenge to you and I this week, find the gifts and have some fun with them this week. Just have some fun with those gifts and use them for God's kingdom. One time I was asked to deliver communion to an individual who had a bad leg because she had an accident the day before. I was a little skeptical, but I didn't say anything. I delivered communion because my gift was a little not patience. I went and delivered communion. And she was on the couch in her house after church that Sunday and really complaining about that leg. And, and, and it looked like it was bad. And I delivered communion. That night I saw her in the mall shopping. <laughs> Let's not use the gifts because we just need to be recognized. We are a team. And we're trying to get to heaven. We're trying to take as many people with as possible. And we have the opportunity to make that happen this afternoon, this week. And if you find out moments, don't be afraid to Facebook me or email me and let it shine. As Paul wraps the scripture up, does he talk about all the gifts? No, he talks about the team. In verse 11, he wraps it up and he says, all these are activated 
by one in the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. Let's see how we can make our gifts shine this week. Amen. I'm going to ask you just to join me in some time of prayer. Gracious Lord, I thank you for Paul. I really do. You talk about a man with many gifts, the perseverance, the gift of perseverance in, in a Roman prison, to even want to have the patience to deal with the church of Corna and do it in genuine love. And write those letters. And they still apply to us today. I thank you for that. So this week, Lord, we're going to have those battles where we just want to be noticed. I know I will. And I just confess that, Lord. And in the midst of that, give us the strength to know that the gift is from you and you know what we're doing. And that in and of itself is more than what we need to be noticed. And as we use our gifts, Lord, it may be helping someone change a tire, a flat tire. It may be helping someone with a project, maybe listening to someone when nobody else wants to listen, maybe pray. As we use our gifts, Lord, help us help you shine. Help us be Jesus with skin on. And so, Lord, we just ask very sincerely, in the midst of this week, let us find our gifts. Let's not put them on the shelf so they can be dusty and turn into some religion. But let's use them for God's kingdom. And see what happens.